Hello everyone. This is Professor Monty. Today we're going to jump into section 3.4. It's called optimization and it's finding absolute maximum and minimum values. In the last section, we looked at relative maximum and minimum values, which is the highest or lowest point in some interval. Well, absolute maximum or minimum just means the highest or lowest point in the whole graph, wherever the graph is defined. So consider a graph. Let's see, we'll make an X and Y axis, and maybe the graph looks something like this. And it ends at these two points. It doesn't continue on forever, so it's going to go from what we'll call from A to B. So this graph is only defined from A to B. Now, the absolute maximum, as I was saying, is the highest point on the curve. Typically, when we talk about absolute maximum or minimum, we're just talking about the Y value. Because the X isn't the highest value. It tells us where it occurs, but the Y value is the actual highest value. And then similarly, the absolute minimum is going to, of course, be the lowest point on the curve. We'll change both of these to on curve instead of of curve. Again, this one's also a y value. Okay, so if we look at the graph that I just drew, we see that this point over here is the highest value on the curve. That's the highest it gets. So that's going to be the absolute max. The absolute min, though, occurs over here. So that's going to be my absolute min. That's the lowest point on the curve. And if we think about other places that might have happened, notice that absolute min, that is a critical value. We do have two other critical values. We have a critical value here and a critical value here. So this was a critical value. And that's actually a relative maximum. At this critical value, we have a relative minimum. This absolute min was also a critical value. Now on the first two going left to right where we have that absolute min, we see that the derivative is zero here because we'd have a horizontal tangent line, derivative is zero here. At this third critical value though, the derivative is undefined because we're at a corner. And so the derivative is not defined there, it's still a critical value because remember critical value is where the derivative is either zero or undefined. Well, the absolute min did happen at a critical value, but the absolute max didn't. So the idea here to start us off, we'll say, I'm going to put it, well, I want to put it underneath. We'll move this up just a little bit. Well, that didn't go up very well. We'll put it right here. An absolute an absolute maximum or minimum on a closed interval from A to B. Can only occur at a critical value CV it's not a CV that was going to be a parentheses critical value or an endpoint notice on the graph that I drew we had the absolute maximum was at that endpoint so that's the first idea in this section. In this section, we have two different things we're going to look at for absolute maximum or minimum. 
One is on a closed interval. So this one's important. This is a closed interval. And in fact, let's do that in color so we highlight it a little bit. Let's see, let's erase that black underline. We'll make it blue. So if we're talking about a closed interval A to B, the absolute max or absolute min can only occur at a critical value or at an endpoint. So we've got that graph that displays it pretty well. So let's go on. I'm going to take a picture out of the book. Let's see if I can just paste it in. See if this one's ready to go. That is not the one I wanted. So we will undo that. Let's see. Let's, let's undo it this way. All right. So let's go grab this. I've got it in my file right here. So let's see, we'll copy this one and then we'll go back. We'll just paste it in right here. There we go. So we've got another curve we want to look at. And so let's look at this in relation to absolute max or mins. Now we see from the graph, we see that there is an absolute max that's not at an endpoint. So we see about right here. You've got an absolute max right there. There's the highest point. The absolute min is going to be over here. That one is an endpoint. This one's clearly a critical value. So that's going to be my absolute max. This endpoint down here is going to be my absolute min, but let's go through the steps. I'll show you how to find this using calculus. All right, so let's move this up a little bit so we have some room to work. So here's the idea. So remember, we first have to find the critical values. So a critical value we find by taking the derivative. Well, the derivative, the four goes to zero, derivative of x is one, derivative of negative x squared is negative two x. So I take the derivative, I set it equal to zero. Remember, this is to find my critical values. And then I solve that. So we'll add two x, divide by two, I get x is one half. That's my only critical value. And so here's what I do. I don't have to do the first derivative test, look to the left and right. I don't have to take the second derivative, plug it in, see if I have a, a relative max or min. Because again, all that's going to tell me is if it's a relative max or min, it won't tell me if it's the absolute or the very highest maximum on the curve. So what I do is I do a little t-chart and I put in x values and then I figure out what f of x is going to be. Remember, that's my y value. So in this case, that's the formula, 4 plus x minus x squared. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in my critical value, and I'm going to plug in my endpoints. Well, notice this was x equals 0, and this was x equals 2, where it started and ended. They tell us right here. So I put in the 0 and 2. Now, these are my endpoints. probably hyphenated. So I plug in the endpoints, plug in the critical value, any critical values I have. Now, one thing to be careful, if your critical value is not in the interval that we're interested in, we throw it away. So say I had gotten a critical value of three. Well, three is not between zero and two, so three can't give me an absolute max or min in the interval zero to two, so I'd throw it away. Or if I got negative a half instead of positive a half. I'd throw it away because it's not in zero to two. But one half clearly is between zero and two, so I keep that. And all I do is I plug these three into the original function, which ever gives me the highest values, the absolute max. Whatever the lowest values, the absolute min. And I may have multiple absolute max if they're the same highest number. Okay, so I plug those in. So when I plug in f of a half, I get four plus a half minus a half squared. So let's see, that's four plus a half minus a fourth. If we want to get these as common denominators, 
I'll multiply this by four over four. 16 fourths plus two fourths minus one fourth. So I get 17 fourths. So I'll put 17 fourths here. Since that's a nice one, let's see, four, that's 4.25 if we plug that into our calculator. If I plug in zero, notice everything goes away but the four. I get four. Ah, 4.25 is bigger than four. And if I plug in two, let's see, four plus two minus two squared. Well, that's four plus two minus four, which is two. So when I look and I say, oh, look, this 17 fourths is the biggest or the largest of those three numbers, that's the absolute max. So let me erase this so we have a little room. I'll erase more of this. We'll erase all that, okay. So going back, I know that's my absolute max. This one's the smallest one, that's my absolute min. And it depends on the author how they want you to write the answer. Some will write this, which I'm not a fan of. One half comma 17 fourths. I'm not a fan of that because the point's not the max, the 17 fourths is the max. So what I like is for them to say the absolute max, it's F of a half, which is the 17 fourths. Now F of a half means it's the function value when you plug in a half. So I know what the X value is, but I do know what the Y value is. This is the absolute max. And then similarly, some authors will write it as two, two, as the absolute min, again, I like saying f of two, which is two, is the absolute min. Again, it's because two is the minimum value. All right, so anyway, that's how it, notice that matches my graph, because if I look at the one half, yeah, that does look like where I am going from the one half, and it's a little above four. Yeah, we said it was 4.25 or four and a quarter. And then at two, X value of two, we get a Y value of two, which was the minimum or the lowest point on the curve. So that all matches up. So let's do the next problem. They're not gonna give us the graph. We just have to know how to do it. So let's see if we can do this one without a graph. It's problem 12, F of X equals X cubed. This time we've got a cubic equation minus x squared minus x plus three. And it says find absolute maximum and minimum values. I'm gonna say absolute extrema. So we get used to that term. Again, extrema just means max and min. on and they give us a closed interval for this one as well. The closed interval is just negative one to zero. So not a very big interval to look at, but we do what we always do. We find the critical values and then we plug the critical values and the endpoints into the original function to find out which gives us the highest and lowest function values. So I do F prime of X, so I get 3x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. Now I'm setting it equal to 0 so that we can find the critical values. Now, we can't factor the 3 out. We have to deal with that 3. There's different ways of factoring that to solve it. Now, if you have problems factoring these, you're always welcome to just use the quadratic formula. But let me show you the illegal move method that I like. Now, this is a new method that often isn't taught. I actually didn't learn it till a couple of years ago. But here's the idea. Now, it, it's kind of weird. This is why it's called the illegal move. I'm going to take this three and I'm multiply it by that one. So I'm going to multiply by three. 
And what it gives me, now the three is gone because I multiplied it by the one. I get x squared minus 2x minus 3. Still equals zero. But now I'm going to factor what I have. So I've got x and x. Let's see. Two numbers that multiply to negative 3 and add to negative 2. Oh, it's negative 3 and positive 1. But here's where it comes in, because I can't just multiply the 3 times the 1. But now what I do to undo that times 3 that I did before, I'm going to divide by 3. So let's do that in blue. So now I'm going to divide by 3. Just the number part right there. And notice the three doesn't go into the one over here on the right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide the three there and make it a three X plus one. This three reduces, I just get X minus one and I've factored it out. That actually, if I multiply it out, if I FOIL that, I'm going to get the three X squared minus two X minus one. I like this method. It always works. It makes it real simple to, to factor if those numbers are small enough that we can deal with them. It always works. Sometimes the numbers just get really big. Now, one thing that's nice, before I slid that three up, I had that X plus one third. One of my solutions is X equals negative one third. The other is X equals the negative one or the positive one rather. But I'll find that by when I solve this now and I go X minus one equals zero. So X equals one. Three X plus one equals zero. 3x equals negative 1, x equals negative 1 third. I could have just taken that from here and just added the one, subtracted the 1 third from both sides and I'm done. Okay, so anyway, I get two critical values. Remember what I said last time, the number, the critical value, so these are both critical values, right? The critical value has to be in the interval. One, here's our interval up here. Our interval is negative one to zero. Positive one's not in that interval. I throw that one away because it's not in the interval negative one to zero. This one is, so I'll check that. So when I do my curve, I go X and Y. Well, I've got negative one third as a critical value and I've got negative one and zero as endpoints. Just write it all as one word this time. And I plug it, it's y, but it's, it's the original function. It's my original f of x function, which in this case was, what was it? x cubed, move that down a little, minus x squared minus x plus three. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna plug these into my calculator. Zero is easy, because everything goes away but the constant, I'll get three. Let's see, but I'm gonna use my calculator, so I am going, parentheses, negative one divided by three, close parentheses, raised to the third. Minus, now I'm just going to do that in my head, minus one ninth, one divided by nine, plus one divided by three, plus three. And I get 3.185185 repeating. And if I just turn that into a fraction, I get 86 twenty sevenths. Now, it's approximately 3.19. Well, here, we'll just, yeah, we'll say it's approximately that. So I can compare it to the three. I know it's bigger. And then if I plug in negative one, well, that, that's probably just as easy just to do plugging it in. Negative one cubed is negative one. Well, here, we'll write this all out. Negative one cubed is negative one. Negative one squares one, but I have the negative in front, so it's another negative one. This gives me a plus one and a plus three. So those cancel out, I get two. So that comes out as a two. That's my lowest one. So that one is my absolute min. So I know right away, this 3.19, that was the biggest. That's my absolute max. I'm going to write it as the fraction so it's not rounded off. And the two is my absolute min. And we'll write that a little more formally for our answer. 
absolute max. Now I'm going to write it the way I said in the last problem. It's F of negative one third, which is 86 27 And the absolute min is F of negative one, which is two. And there's my answers. Again, they may write it as a point. You'll just have to see how the computer asks you to do it. In class, I like you to write it this way because you need to know that the Y value is the max, not the X value. Okay, let's do another one of these and then we'll look at the other type of problem in this section. So this is problem 22. It asks the same type of question. They give us F of X and they give us a fraction. 4X is the numerator, the denominator X squared plus one. And it's find, that doesn't spell find, find absolute extrema on, and they give us the closed interval negative three to positive three. Okay. So again, start the same way, take the derivative, set it equal to zero. I have to use the quotient rule this time. So remember, that's low d high minus high d low, square the bottom and away we go. So I go low d high minus high d low, square the bottom and away we go. All right, so let's see, let's distribute this, move that up a little bit. I'll get 4x squared plus 4. And then when I multiply these, I get minus 8x squared. All over x squared plus 1 squared. Now, the 4x squared and the minus 8x squared, that's going to give me negative 4x squared. All right, so let's do this. We'll set the top equal to zero. That's where the fraction is gonna equal zero, critical value. We also set the bottom equal to zero. That's where the fraction's undefined, which either way is a critical value. So let's see, when I do this, I'm gonna divide both sides by negative four and I get X squared minus one equals zero. Well, that factors into X plus one, X minus one. If you want to add the one to both sides and take the square root, remember to do the plus or minus because we're going to get X plus one equals zero, X minus one equals zero, which gives me X equals negative one, X equals positive one. Both are in the interval negative three to three, which this problem sets. So we use both of those critical values. Over here on the right side, we can take the square root of both sides, again, plus or minus, square root of zero, zero, positive zero, negative zero, still both zero, but it gets rid of the square. I get X squared plus one equals zero. Subtract one, I get X squared equals negative one. Take the square root again, but the problem is I'm taking the square root of a negative number. So that gives me X equals plus or minus I, and imaginary numbers are not critical values. So these two are critical values. So I only get two critical values in my interval. So now I set up the problem again and I go X and Y, I put in my critical values and I put in my endpoints. Those are the only places I can have an absolute max or min. And remember Y is the original function. So that was four X over X squared plus one. So that's my original function, 4x over x squared plus 1. All right, so let's see. If I plug in negative 1, I'm going to get negative 4, and then x squared is 1 over 2. So this is a negative 2. If I plug in positive 1, I get 4 over 2, so I get positive 2. If I plug in negative 3, I get negative 12 over 10 which is negative 1.2. That time I'll go to a decimal because it ends. I'm not rounding anything off. 
And if I plug in three, I get positive 12 over 10, so positive 1.2. So this time, the critical values gave me both the absolute max and the absolute min. So absolute min, absolute max. And so I'll write that out again. Absolute, we'll do the max first. F of one, which is two. Absolute min, F of negative one, which is negative two. And we're done. All right, so if we're doing absolute max or mins on a closed interval, it's pretty easy, we find the critical value, we plug the critical values and the endpoints into the original function. Whichever gives me the highest value is the absolute max. Well, whatever the largest value is, is the absolute max. Whatever the smallest value is, is the absolute min. But what if we don't have any endpoints? So, to find absolute max and min on open interval. So we'll call it just A to B. This time I have parentheses because we don't get to use the endpoints. It changes the way we have to do it. Now, all our author in this book is showing us is if in the open interval, we only have a single critical value. Then all we do is use, either use the first derivative test, look to the left and right, see if it's increasing or decreasing, and then if it changes, then you have an absolute max or min. Or use the second derivative test. If it's concave up, you have an absolute min. If it's concave down, you have an absolute max. Did I say that right? If it's concave up, you have an absolute min. If it's concave down, you have an absolute max. Okay. I still don't know if I'm saying that right, but we'll go from there and we'll interpret. So to find the absolute max and min on an open interval, here's the big key to this book. If we only have one critical value, in the interval, use first derivative or second derivative test to determine if max or min. Since only one critical value it must be absolute extrema. I will say max or min, max slash min. It's one or the other, it can't be obviously, obviously both. But if you think about it, if I've got an interval and there's only one critical value, well, I've got a critical value right here. If I find that's a relative min, well, it has to be an absolute min because it can't come back down. In order for it to come back down, there had to be another critical value. We're saying, wait, there's not. There's only one critical value. If we only have one critical value. So if it's, if it's a min, it can't come back down. If it's a max, it can't go back up. So that's the idea. If we were looking at it where we didn't have only one critical value, if we had two, we'd have to do some other stuff. We'd have to actually take limits as X goes toward whatever our values are. Limit as X approaches A and the limit as X approaches B to figure out if it goes up further or down further than what our max or min at those local or relative extreme or were. So anyway, let's look at a couple problems of these. I've got problem 30 as my first problem to look at. And it looks like this. F of X equals X minus four thirds X cubed. Now that four thirds is nice because the three is going to cancel when we take the derivative. Doesn't make it as nice when we plug things in to find out the Y value, but it makes it nice to set it equal to zero. 
find absolute extrema. This time, well, that doesn't spell extrema, does it? Extrema on, they're not giving us a closed interval. On this problem, they say zero to infinity. So all the positive numbers. All right, so I can't plug in zero. It's not part of this function. So it's not part of the domain. So I can't plug it in and find out that endpoint. So there's no endpoints to plug in. So let's go through. Again, just like on a closed interval, we find the critical values. I was just checking to make sure I wrote down the problem, right? I did. So the derivative of x is one. Bringing down the three, it cancels the three on the bottom. I get minus four x squared equals zero. Add the four x squared, I get one equals four x squared. Divide by four, one fourth equals x squared. Now I can take the square root of both sides. I do have to say plus or minus. The derivative of one is one, the derivative of four is two, the derivative, the square root. So I get plus or minus a half, but I'm only to find on zero to infinity. So I throw out the negative one half because it's not in zero to infinity. So I've only got one critical value, which was a key to us doing this problem. All I do now is I determine if X is a half is a relative minimum or a relative maximum. If it's a relative minimum, it has to be the absolute max because it's the only critical value. If it's a relative max, it has to be the absolute max because it's the only critical value. So now I have two choices, first derivative test or second derivative test. Let me show you with the second derivative test. And I don't want to use the blue. I want to go back to the black. So here's second derivative test. I take the second derivative. I've got that one minus four X squared. Well, the one goes away. I just get negative eight X. And then I plug in my positive half. Negative eight times a half is definitely a negative number. It's negative four. We don't really care about the number. We just care that it's negative. Because if the second derivative is negative, it means the function's concave down there. And if the second if it's concave down, it has to be, therefore, that means therefore, it has to be the absolute max. So that's using the second derivative. The second derivative is nice. Original function was a polynomial, so the second derivative is always nice. I know that it has to be an absolute max at one half. Well, what is it? Well, let's plug it in. I'm, I'm going to use my calculator. The y value is f of one half, which is one half minus four thirds times one half cubed. Should I go ahead and do that? We'll do it here instead of on my calculator. So I get one half. Well, that's minus four thirds times one eighth. Four goes in there once, goes in there twice. This was at times. And so I get one sixth. So it's one half minus one sixth, or getting a common denominator, multiply this by three over three, I get three sixths minus one sixth, which is of course two sixths which is one third, good heavens. And if you're doing it in your calculator, it would be simple enough to do, you just do the one divided by two, minus four divided by three times parentheses, one divided by two quantity squared, and I'm looking at mine, Let's see if I got the right answer. Let's see. One half, four thirds. Did I plug it into that top one? Let's see. Four divided by three. Times one eighth. Yeah, that's one sixth. Okay, 
We're beautiful right there. All right. So I get that as my Y value. Again, that was the absolute max. And so when I just write it out, my answer, absolute max, F of a half, which is a third. No absolute min. On any of these open intervals, you're only going to have an absolute max or an absolute min, but not both. Because remember, you only have one critical value. All right. So there was that one. Let's try another one of these. What's the interval we had here? Zero to infinity. Okay. All right. So let's jump from there. Let's go into 34. Get some more practice on this. This one gives us f of x equals x squared plus 250 over x. And again, it's on zero to infinity. And they're asking for absolute max and min again. I'm going to rewrite the function to make it easier to take the derivative. We'll call that x squared plus 250x to the negative 1. So that when I take my derivative, I get 2x minus 250x to the negative 2. And I'm going to set that equal to 0. But remember that 2x minus, now the 250 over x to the negative 2 means 250 over x squared. So I'm going to multiply both sides by x squared. When I distribute that in, I'm going to get 2x cubed minus 250 equals 0. Divide both sides by 2. x cubed minus 125 equals 0. That's the difference of two cubes. It's easier to see this way, add the 125 to both sides and then take the cubed root. We lose two of the answers, but the two answers we lose are complex numbers, which aren't critical values anyway. I don't say plus or minus because it's an odd root and I get x equals five. Now notice it's not plus or minus five because negative five cubed isn't positive 125, it'd be negative 125. That's why we only get one critical value instead of two. Okay, so anyway, one critical value, we just have to determ determine if it's a relative max or min, and then it'll be absolute as well. So let's see. Last time we did the second derivative test, let's do the first derivative test this time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put 5 on here, and I'm going to look to the left, so I'm going to test. Now, I can't go, I can't plug in 0 because that wasn't in my interval. Remember, I was 0 to infinity open interval. So let's plug in, say, 1 and 10. Anything to the left of 5 that's within 0 to infinity, and then anything to the right of 5. And I'm going to plug them into the first derivative. Okay? And remember, the first derivative right here, we'll, we'll do this in green. There's my first derivative. So I'm just going to plug them in in my head. I plug it in. I plug in a 1. I get 2 minus 250. Pretty sure that's negative. So that's negative, which tells me here. You know what? Let's use let's just use black for this, so that I can use more than one thing. The derivative's negative, which means the function's going down. I plug in ten. When I plug in ten, I get twenty, and then two fifty divided by ten squared is a hundred. So that's two point five. So I get twenty minus two point five. Well, that's positive which says the function is going up. Therefore, we must have an absolute minimum at x equals 5. Again, 5 is not the minimum. It's whatever we get when we plug it into the original function. So f of 5, right? That's going to be my y value. Let's go back to the original function. I get x squared plus 250 over x. So x... 5 squared plus 250 over 5. Yep. So what's that? 25. Let's see. 5 goes into 25 five times, and then we have the 0, so 50. 
75. That's my absolute max. Oops, that's my absolute min. It was a big number. I figured it must be a maximum. So my absolute min is f of 5, which is 75. Should we say no absolute max? And notice we can check something. Notice we plug in one. I get one squared plus 250 over one, which is 251. Oh, that's a lot higher than 75. So it could be a min. You could plug in something on the other side too. What would the 100? The 10 is going to be 100 plus 25. Oh, 125. That's better than 75 also. So the 75 seems reasonable to be a minimum value. All right. So that's on an open interval. We can only do it if there's a single critical value. But if it is, if it's a relative min, it has to be the absolute min. If it's a relative max, it has to be the absolute max. We saw how to test it with both the second derivative test and the first derivative test. This would have been an easy one to do the first, the second derivative test with also. All right, now let's go in. One more problem I wanna show you. It's an application of these, just so that we get something to work with. It's what I originally post it in there. Let's see. All right. So if I go here, we'll post that in. Advertising. Sound software estimates that it will sell n units of a program after spending a thousands of dollars on advertising, where n of a, the number will sell after a thousand dollars of advertising. They give this the formula, the function. Notice they give us this a is between zero and 300. This is a closed interval. That's the same thing as saying, hey, find the absolute max on the closed interval A to B, which in this case is zero to 300. So I do have a closed interval. Find the maximum number of units that can be sold. Well, units sold, that's N. Where I'm going to put that, N. Um, and the amount that must be spent on advertising, that's A, in order to achieve that maximum. All right, let's do it. So we do it closed interval. So remember, we just have to find the endpoints and the critical values within those endpoints and plug them in to see which gives us the highest number of units sold. So I start off, I take the derivative, negative 2a plus 300. That was quick. Set it equal to zero. Let's see. I'll add the 2a to both sides. 300 equals 2a divided by 2. I get 150. That's in my interval. So all I do is I say, okay, well, let's see. Let's do X. Oops, that's not X, it's A. Let's do A and N of A, which was what? Negative A squared plus 300A plus 6. Notice we're not squaring the negative. We're just squaring the A and then making the whole thing negative. So I'm going to plug in my 150, which was my critical value. And I'll plug in the 0 and 300, which are my endpoints. And whatever output is the largest is my maximum number of units sold. So let's see. So I'm going to use my calculator here. So I'm going negative 150 squared. Now that should give you a negative 22,500 plus 300 times 150 plus 6. That gives me 22,506 units sold. Zero is easy. Everything with an A goes away. I just get six. Hmm. So if I spend $0,000 on advertising, I'm going to sell six units. Eh, I want to sell more units. Oh, look, at $150,000 in advertising, we're going to sell 22,506 units. And then at 300, so I'll go negative 300 squared. Again, that should give you a negative number, plus 300 times 300, plus six. I get six again, because the negative 100 squared canceled the 300 times 300. And so here's my absolute max. Remember, A was in A thousands of dollars. 
So to answer the question, it says find the maximum number of units sold. So max units sold 22,506 units when we spend a hundred and fifty now remember that's in thousands of dollars on advertising so a hundred and fifty thousand dollars on advertising and we got to our answer we knew the absolute max had to be at either the critical value or an endpoint, and it was, of course, at the critical value. And we know that that's a downward parabola, so we knew its shape. But where along the curve is the vertex? Well, clearly it was right in the middle of the zero and the 300, is it 150? So, anyway, practice this stuff. That's the two ideas is how to find the absolute max or min on a closed interval and also on an open interval. So make sure you understand how to do each of those because they will both, of course, be on the test. All right, with that, I will talk to you later. I hope things are going well and keep up the hard work.